being present today as we all seek to learn more about the fight against modern-day slavery and decreasing its demand. As a survivor of sex trafficking, because of my own intimate struggle with this oppressive force, and because courage is an expert in turning harsh experiences into wisdom, I can provide you with a glimpse of the blueprint that I have created as I have joined in this movement to fight this beast. My name is Regina Evans, and I'm the owner of Regina's Door, an Oakland, California-based social enterprise vintage clothing boutique. On the face of it, it is a very typical clothing store. In the deep terrain of it, Regina's Door is a sanctuary space which supports survivors of sex trafficking, homeless youth, and young artists. This includes providing food, clothing, finances for housing, travel expenses, and even babysitting. 
On any given day, the boutique is visited by survivors who take part in healing circles, meditation, yoga, writing classes, poetry forums, and music events. We have produced theatrical performances, fashion photo shoots, videos, and even a magazine. The creative arts is a strong and effective pathway to healing. Regina's door is a safe space where you might find survivors detailing their thoughts and strength to a group of young men. It is a space where mothers of exploiters who are now in jail have cried upon my shoulder. And it is a space where fathers can learn how to protect their children from the harm of modern day slavery. But most of all, it is a place of safety where relationships can be nurtured. And why is this important? And how does this relate to decreasing demand? In this manner, when we develop a deep sense of responsibility for one another, it is much harder for societal inequities such as trafficking to take a hold in our communities because we don't destroy what we love. We nourish it, we protect it because we wish to see it thrive. And indeed, at Regina's door, it would not exist without such nourishment from the beloved community. We are strengthened by our volunteers who give their time, professional skills, talents, and financial resources. Modern day slavery, this is a huge issue and it has many moving parts. And often people don't know how to access this fight. Or they believe because the scope of this fight is so massive that what they have to offer is simply not enough. That small acts of kindness are not enough that it is not enough to help one child. Yes, we would dearly love for you to consistently be committed to this cause and to help the many. But I want to tell you from my survivor heart, if you only have the capacity to help the one, that that is enough. Be present in their life. Learn from them as you are caring for them. And if at a later time you have the capacity to help others, utilize that knowledge that you have gained and be present in their lives as well. When I opened Regina's door, I started with one helping one survivor. She is now in college, a website designer, and a thriving survivor advocate. If you can change one life in this fight, you have potentially changed a huge flow in the tide of inequity. Dare to be present. One year ago, Regina's door launched the um, youth and artist space, I will not participate anti-trafficking campaign. This campaign has amongst its ranks several survivors and it utilizes the creative arts to spread awareness about how to decrease the demand of sex trafficking in our city. The campaign was launched with three Oakland artist collectives, the Oakland Mind, the Wombs, and the WCC. It was also launched with the assistance of two notorious ex-exploiters, these two men, who had previously sold the bodies of women with impunity, now stood hand to heart in unity with healed survivors and compassionate artists to advocate for young children being trafficked. Again, such moments only occur because long ago someone dared to be present in my life so that I can now maintain a community space which is utilized as a platform to speak out against injustices leveled against our children, dare to be present. Last December, the I Will Not Participate campaign also organized its first annual Stop Demand Night. The event took place on a night when businesses in our city maintained late hours of operation, and it was organized in concert with the CEASE Network, which unites cities across the United States that are committed to utilizing demand reduction strategies. On the night, our team of volunteers trained over 60 local businesses. We delivered information on the red flags of child sex trafficking, passed out pamphlets from local anti-trafficking organizations, provided information on resources that are available to survivors, and focused upon how to use reportjohn.org to report incidences of child sex trafficking to the Oakland Police Department. I don't, I don't have all the answers. I'm just one person. So I don't have all the answers of how to stem the tide. What I can tell you that existing anti-trafficking entities will benefit from your professional skill set, your willingness to volunteer your time, and your artistic talents. But most of all, those seared by trafficking will benefit 
from your humanity, simply as you dare to be present. Thank you for your time. Heard the proverbial phrase, a hard act to follow. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you so much, Regina and Ceremony. You know, when we were preparing this panel, Regina said to me, as we were encountering storms and obstacles getting here, I am no stranger to pressure. And you know what pressure makes, diamonds and pearls. Well, that is a fact where all of you are concerned. Thank you so much. I, you're also a living testament to the fact that we talk about global resources, but our greatest global resource, I believe, is our latent, untapped human genius, our human resources. And when 50% of our population remains untapped and undeveloped, oppressed and imprisoned, then we've left our greatest resource on the planet aside, the very resource that would help us solve all of our world issues. And that is why we are here with you today, and I have been tasked with sort of the official cat herder here, the ringleader of this circus. So my name is Sheba Parr, and I am the co-vice president with my husband who's sitting here, Robert Browning, in the front row. We are fellow co-vice presidents of a United Nations peace messenger organization called Pathways to Peace. So why would a UN peace messenger organization be here at the Commission on the Status of Women talking about human trafficking? You know, uh, when I attended my first CSW, I learned that more women have died in gender-based violence than all the soldiers in all the world's wars in all of history combined because of their gender. And I discovered that we cannot talk about building a culture of peace without addressing gender-based violence. And we cannot address gender-based violence without addressing sex trafficking of all peoples, but especially of women and girls, children which is why the 16th Sustainable Development Goal of Peace and Justice has as its second target ending trafficking and exploitation. And so we are here as all of us delegates of Pathways to Peace to talk about ending human trafficking today through what I call a trim tab solution. Anybody here know Buckminster Fuller? And trim tabs, for those who don't know, are a very small part of very large ships. And when the trim tab turns, it turns the whole ship. And so we are here to look at, as a panel today with all of you, intercepting demand as a trim tab solution to ending human trafficking. Now, as Miss Regina so articulately said, each of us are only one person, and we don't have the answer to ending human trafficking. We're coming to you with humility. If we did have the answer, then it would be over. But what we do want to do is engage in, in inciting dialogue with you, with some of the best practices that we have stumbled upon to, to end this modern day scourge that President Jimmy Carter has called the greatest human rights violation in the history of human. And it begins for us with the heart, with appreciating all of you who are here in this room, that each of us is only one person, but each person that does what they can do in concert, together with other people, becomes that trim tab solution that changes the entire direction of our humanity. And so I want to pause for a moment and just invite you to appreciate yourselves just by sitting in this room, you have already become, and already many of you are, a part of the solution. And I also invite you to activate compassion. Compassion for this horrendous mess that is the sex trade, which we will come back to in its importance. So 
involved in the sex trafficking world at any given time, there are always three players. The trafficker, the seller, the trafficked person, the sold, and the buyer. And without a buyer, there is no need for supply and the seller makes no money. So while much of our focus on the panel today, all of us as panelists have in some way or other touched all three corners of this trial, but our first focus on the panel is the purchaser. And we have to establish here, because it is so easy in our Hollywood world of evil and good and good conquers evil, to think that this, this, this is the evil side of the triangle. And what I'm going to invite us to do, if we can reserve judgment, is hold everyone in this triangle in compassion. In our work with human traffickers and rehabilitating buyers, our experiences, they use money, much of the same language that survivors and victims do, which is, I broke free of that. We could imagine for a moment that this entire triangle is a prison. And we all know that enabling abusers to continue their abuse, have I died? Enabling, how's that? Perfect, thank you. Enabling abusers to continue their abuse does not help them, nor does it help their victims. So our first investigation here is looking at how we stop the perpetrators, the buyers. So let's look at the ambiance of this whole world for a moment, and please forgive me those educated in the audience for whom this is review. So, if you imagine that we, those of us that are invested in ending human trafficking, are that little dollar sign there, and that dollar sign means more than just financial resources. This is human resources. Those of us in government agencies, law enforcement, NGOs, and civil society who are working to end human trafficking. So we're that little pile of resource there. And the International Office of Labor, or that, the ILO, the International Labor Organization, estimates that human trafficking is a $150 billion industry annually. Now, that includes labor trafficking and sex trafficking, but we know, especially where women are labor trafficked, often sex trafficking is a component of that. So if that's $150 billion annually, that means... 45 million plus misraginas. 45 million human beings enslaved and being sold. The problem is so vast. The UN Office of Drugs and Crime has suggested that human trafficking is now set to outpace both the drugs trade and the arms trade as the largest illicit industry in the world. And one of the things driving the acceleration of this in the world is media, technology, and the internet. It is now easier for human beings to purchase each other, each other than ever before. 75% of children sold for sex were purchased online. So, those of us working in this field, whether we work with government, law enforcement, UN agencies, or NGOs, have been looking at this primarily as a crime and a human rights violation, which of course it is. And so we put our resources toward rescuing victims, prosecuting perpetrators, and the problem with these strategies is that as soon as we do that, there are more to take their place. So it is outpacing all our efforts. To conquer this issue, those of us sitting on this panel began to realize that we need to think about it differently. Yes, it's a human rights violation. Yes, it's a crime. But to get leverage, remember that trim tab solution that really turns the tide, we decided we need to think about human trafficking the way the traffickers do. So, 
This may be a stretch, I realize, but we could imagine for a moment that I'm a human trafficker. Now, if I have a couple of these AK-47s in my back seat, when I pass through a border, or let's say I have some of this crap cocaine in my trunk, there's evidence of a crime. But if I have one of these sitting in my back seat, and this is horrific to say, but it's true, one who has been properly manipulated, coerced, brainwashed, and threatened to say the right things. There is no evidence of a crime. And not only that, it's very efficient, because her, I can sell over and over and over again. And each one of these things, I have to reacquire and resell, and each one of those transactions is a personal risk to me. So as a human trafficker, Selling her is good business. For the human traffickers, human trafficking is a business. And all business is driven by demand. Now there's some interesting things that we know about demand. Demand for paid sex. 20% of men worldwide have purchased sex, but 25% of sex buyers around the world come from the United States. This gives us, those of us in that little green dollar sign over there, a huge zone of influence to make change. Now, in order to make that change, we need a solution that's bigger than the problem. Law enforcement by itself, government agencies by themselves, and NGOs by themselves are not big enough to solve this problem. But there are more civilians who don't buy sex than there are those involved in the sex trade. So just to give you a perspective here on how demand drives the market and some of the data that we have on this, this comes to us from our law enforcement partners in Seattle. On an average night in Seattle, there are 4,000 trafficked slaves, young girls and women, being sold. But there are 21,000 men that want to buy them. If we want to have influence, just look to see what our greatest influence is. So how are we going to conquer that? Well, we need an army as big as the army of buyers and bigger, and that is the civilian army that we, as NGOs, government agencies, and law enforcement, can enroll in intercepting demand at no personal risk. And we're going to talk to you more about how that happens. When we do that, there are two things. One, we have an army that's bigger than the problem. But when we do it from a place of genuine caring, two things happen. Remember that compassion I was talking about earlier? So this comes to us from a research partner of ours in California. It's discovered that when we come from a place of compassion and care, it actually changes our physiology in such a way that it lights up innovative centers of the brain, creates innovative problem solving, reduces burnout, and increases collaboration. So we get more personal coherence and collective coherence. And I think that we could all agree, you'll tell me if you do or not, <laughs> that human trafficking and the violence of the sex trade is a fundamentally incoherent aspect of our society. So when we create an intelligent civilian army that is responding to this issue with genuine care. We have an answer that is bigger than the problem, but also more effective than the problem because it is intrinsically coherent. So one of the expressions of how this is happening on the ground is something that Ms. Regina mentioned earlier, the CEASE network, Cities Empowered Against Sexual Exploitation. This is 11 cities in the United States that came together to make a commitment to measurably reduce human trafficking by 20% in two years. And they're using several best practices that we're going to keep anchoring back to in our panel today. One of them is this business of collaboration. Another is the business of demand interception and disrupting demand. 
And, um, you know, another that it, uh, we're going to re-emphasize again and again is getting law enforcement and civil society working arm in arm. And so the cities and the CIS network have done that, and many of us on the panel are members of CIS and actually met through the CIS network. So our partner at the district attorney's office in Alameda County so believes in this arm-in-arm -arm collaboration between law enforcement and civil society that she said, community involvement is essential to com combating demand for sex trafficking, often more impactful and permanent a solution and prosecution and law enforcement interventions. So we'll give a nod to Robin, who wished that she could be here today. And some of the things that um, the CIS network have done, just to give you some examples of how the community and law enforcement are working together. Uh, they've created a California Buyer Beware website. So when men in this particular county in California search to buy sex online, this website pops up and lets them know that their IP address is on the radar of law enforcement. Yeah, right? <laughs> and often that just by itself is a sufficient deterrent. They've also created this billboard advertising campaign to enroll men to stop sex trafficking. The entire campaign, by the way, is open source. Meaning if any of you want to use this campaign in your communities, you can write to info at heatwatch.org and they will supply you with all their graphic design and access to their website. So um, this can be a community viral project. Another thing that they did there, um, which Ms. Regina spoke of, is a Report John app. So members of the community that see suspicious behavior on the street can take a picture of a man or his license plate and post that to the app, which then gets delivered to Oakland County Law Enforcement. They search his website through driver registration, and he receives a warning letter letting him know he is now on the radar of law enforcement. So these are just some of the ways. Another, actually, do you any guys in the audience know Traffic Cam? So this is something, how many of you are here in New York staying in a hotel? Raise your hands. So when you go home tonight, Hudson, I want you to download Traffic Cam, and all you do is take a picture of your hotel room, and you post it to Traffic Cam, and the FBI logs that photograph and measures them with a data bank of thousands of photographs of children posing in pictures in hotel rooms across the country, and is able to locate those children being sold for sex much more quickly, and makes rescues hundreds of times more possible. All you have to do if you stay in a hotel is upload the photograph of your hotel room to traffic cam. These are ways that civil society and community are working together with law enforcement to build a civilian army that is bigger and more coherent than the problem. But for that to work, let's see what's happened with my slide. not registering and I have a beautiful map for you that you can't see, but I will describe it to you. For this to work, it really requires that countries have legislation that empowers law enforcement and civil society to take action. So just a very, very quick review on the legislative approach to human trafficking worldwide. There are basically four approaches right now in the world. Um, there are countries like, actually I'm not going to say, I wish you could see it, but there are countries that have no legislation at all, so it's just a free-for-all. Then there are countries and one state in the United States, Nevada, countries like Holland and Germany, where they've made trafficking legal and call it sex work, and uh, supposedly regulate it that way. Then there are countries... Um, like most of the United States, where sex trafficking and prostitution are illegal. And we might think, well, that's wonderful, that protects victims. But in fact, we have to acknowledge, even in the United States today, sex trafficking is the only crime in which the victims 
of the crime are made the criminals. There are children being trafficked in the United States today who are not old enough to consent for sex, but have been arrested and prosecuted for prostitution. When I heard facts like this at my first commission on the status of women four years ago, I have to tell you, I was devastated beyond belief, and my day job is teaching stress management. I was a, I was a dentist with some bad cavities. I was in such despair, I was actually sitting in this very room on a pew right where Regina is four years ago today when I couldn't go to the next little thing I'd circled in my catalog of events because I was just floored. And into that room, onto this stage, thank goodness I couldn't move, walked this woman, Gudrun Jansdottir from Iceland. Does anyone recognize her from the opening ceremonies? Was anyone there? Yes, Erin was there. So Gudrun stepped on the stage and she said, after statistic after statistic and data point after data point, the horrors going on, enough! In Iceland, we don't just sit around whining about these things. We get up off the couch and do something about it. And she proceeded to tell a story that I'm going to tell you right now. Good for a little story time? So in Iceland, they fought to pass the fourth kind of law. The laws first passed in Norway and Sweden, called the Nordic Laws, which decriminalized the prostituted person, but criminalized the buyer and the seller. So when I saw Bruden on the stage four years ago, there were only three countries that had passed this innovative law. Sweden, Norway, and Iceland became the third. They fought for 10 years to pass this legislation. Now, by the way, we've added Canada, France, Northern Ireland. On the day the law passed, the Icelandic women gathered, the lobbyists gathered, and had a champagne toast, as is their favorite thing to do. And while they were drinking champagne, onto national television came the Icelandic police chief, who said, this is the stupidest law I've ever heard of. Prostitution is the oldest profession in the book. Now, most of us in this room would say it's the oldest oppression in the book. He said, I have no intention of implementing this law. I don't have the staff, the resources. Forget it. This is a stupid law. Well, at that point, over a good amount of champagne, you think I just had some, but I haven't. <laughs> Over their champagne, the Icelandic woman said, enough. We've tried to play by the rules. Now we're going to take matters into their own hands. So what did they do? Well, if the traffickers and the buyers can buy anonymous phones and place ads in the paper and online, why can't we? So they placed decoy ads, and the younger they said they were, the more calls they got. Within an hour of placing their first ad, they received over 300 phone calls. And they picked up the phone and said, Big sister is watching you. <laughs> when they got bored with that, they said, Why are we doing this? Oh, right, to help the poor police who don't have enough money and resources. Well, let's help them a little more. So when buyers called for sex, they said, Here's the address, and it, they sent them straight to the police chief's house for services. <laughs> so their antics went on and on, and uh, we don't have time to tell you their whole story here, but we are working on a feature film to tell their story in a movie. After a period of time, they had gathered over 140 names, phone numbers, and email addresses of buyers of sex as well as pictures of their penises that they sent when they solicited sex. So they decided it was time to hold a press conference, but realized that their anonymity was their power. Because bit by bit, they began to destabilize the sex trade in Iceland because men didn't know when they were calling to buy sex from a child if they would get instead their mother, or their wife, or their sister, or their girlfriend on the phone. 
So they invited all the buyers to their press conference, telling them it was going to be hot women models from Eastern Europe. And they also invited the press, and they wore neon burkas. They had a penis PowerPoint and asked everyone in the audience, does anyone recognize that one? <laughs> and then, as you can see in the bottom picture here, in the Icelandic cold, they marched the 144 names, email addresses, and telephone numbers to the police chief's desk with the media following them. Well, a week after their press conference, the Icelandic government thought this must be an important thing. So they assigned 25 million krona to creating a special police task force to ending human trafficking in Iceland. Thirteen brothels that were posing as champagne clubs were shut down by the police. Uh, multiple buyers of prosecution, prostitution were actually arrested and prosecuted, even though they were told they couldn't use the information because it was entrapment. And the first traffickers were prosecuted in Iceland after that operation. Perhaps equally as significant, they did develop a clothing line beyond their neon burkas. And the police chief now proudly wears these outside of his uniform, I am responsible boxer shorts. <laughs> so the big sisters really pulled off something extraordinary, did they not? When I heard Gudrun share this on this stage four years ago, I was lifted out of my despair and realized we really can make a difference. Individual human beings that care when we come together are that which changes the tide of the world. And there are several best practices of theirs that we want to highlight that are going to show up again in the panel. They made it fun. And the fun and the playfulness and the humor and the non-shame-based humor and the engagement of the perpetrators created that coherence that went viral, that spread in Iceland through the jungle telegraph, kitchen table to kitchen table. Not all of the big sisters even know each other. They also celebrated every small win along the way with champagne. That doesn't hurt. <laughs> But those things kept their positive emotional fuel going so that they maintained their coherence and they, and they maintained their solidarity. And ultimately, they also collaborated with law enforcement to intercept demand. So finally, they used the same tools the traffickers do, anonymity and technology. And we're going to see that theme reappear. So at Operation Big Sister, I, I ran up to Gudrun, I'm not a filmmaker, but I was like, this story has to be told to as many people as possible. So I asked her if anyone had bought her life rights, and she laughed out loud. We now have the life rights to the 85 Big Sisters. We're in development on a feature film about their lives. We're also creating a documentary film about them and other grassroots efforts that are effective in ending human trafficking. So if you have one out there, Come see us afterward. We may want to include you in our documentary. We are also building an online platform for action at OperationBigSister.com, where eventually anyone can log in from anywhere in the world and intercept callers from buyers of sex based on decoy ads and be a big sister. Uh, and finally, my colleague Diane is going to talk about our house parties. <laughs> We're calling it that okay. Or whatever we want to call it. Yeah, we might change the name, we'll see. Um, so yeah, um, part one of the projects for Operation Big Sister, which I've been um, championing, champion, well, I can't even say it, so never mind. But anyway, working on, is our awareness raising house parties, is what we're calling them now. Don't forget about the fundraising. The, oh, yes, awareness raising fundraising house fun. parties. Not fun. <laughs> and those gatherings, it's inspired by the Icelandic Big Sisters, Jungle Telegraph, uh, spreading the word about sex trafficking at the grassroots level, kitchen table to kitchen table. And when I heard that, I went, well, let's see if we can duplicate that. And so what I pictured in my mind, I had this vision, you know how you see maps, either with pins in them or you see these little lights, you know? And a lot of times you see those maps that show where trafficking is occurring. So I pictured lights all over the map of people who are hosting 
these gatherings and talking about sex trafficking in their homes and getting educated and spreading the word um, widely. That's my goal. That's our goal. So uh, when I was preparing for talking to you about what we're doing, I ran across UNESCO's 2006 Manual on Awareness Raising. And uh, in one of the sections, they talk about the seven steps for social change. And I want to highlight the first three steps because they really hit the mark in our three goals for uh, developing the, these uh, fundraising, no, awareness raising, fundraising, fundraising house parties. And the first step they talk about is that people have to be aware that there's a problem, right? You have to know it exists. The second thing they talk about is that they have to imagine a different future. They have to know the problem exists, but that's not enough. They have to imagine a different future. And then third, for the change to happen, they have to know what to do uh, to help make that change. So that's what we're incorporating in these gatherings. Um, so I'll tell you just a little bit about what they kind of look like. Um, we, we're starting them out uh, with the message that we can all be part of the solution. And so but we tell the big sister story. We emphasizing how a, a small group of people can make a huge difference and actually have fun doing it. Then we take a, maybe I shouldn't have said a question more, and have fun doing it. <laughs> <laughs> then after that, we take a sober look at the vast global and domestic issue of human trafficking, and in particular, sex trafficking. We also explain how, so this is a big part of it, explain how intercepting demand is one of the critical strategies, how it's being done, who's doing it, and why it is an effective strategy. Then we give people information about what they can do. Um, you want to just do that? Okay. Um, so then the last part of what we do is this is on our website, and it's actually a take action page. So you can go in there. Each one of these circle, circles is something that you can do. Uh, and so we're hoping that what we're planning on is we'll be expanding that, but also that people can find a path into helping. So for example, there are there's things for parents, for teachers, people who work in the hospitality industry. So we're going to show that to people, say you can get involved. Uh, and I heard some things today at other panels that I'll tell Sheva about that we can add to this that are all other ways in if none of, none of these fit. Um, so what we're doing is we're, we're creating um, a kit uh, for people. We're, we're designing it with the steps that I just described. And what we're hoping to do is that people will use it. So um, we've piloted it, and we've gotten some feedback, and so we're incorporating that feedback back into the kit, developing it, and it'll be out soon. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that or anything else that our panel talks about today, I'm going to pass around a, a tablet, and you can put your name, organization, and email, and we'll put you in the loop, and you can stay connected with us and, and uh, can you, can you continue to learn what we're doing. Is stuck. We were always curious were the big sisters just an anomaly? Something that would only work in a tiny micro population, like an island in the middle of in between two continents, Iceland, with 300,000 people. Did demand interception work there only because everybody knows everybody and you get caught? And so joining the CIS network gave us the answer to that question especially through Tom Perez, who's our next speaker. Let me just make this statement um, in the hopes that we all remember it, and actually, if you forget everything else, remember this. The smartphone in your pocket is the brothel of the 21st century. It's just like the, the red door on that old house in the bad part of town in days gone by. The, the technology that fuels the smartphone is a gateway to a global business system where men pay to rape and abuse the vulnerable 
and where others profit from that transaction. Now, at the end of the day, my best qualification for speaking to you is that I am the proud father of three beautiful daughters. I'm not a politician. I'm not a law enforcement official. I'm not a um, celebrity with any kind of a platform that would afford me broad influence. I'm just a guy who happens to know a lot of guys just like me. Several years ago, about three years ago, um, we started asking a question. The question is simply this. What if the very same technology that's being used to exploit women and youth could be used against those doing the exploiting? Now, to, to help you kind of get a feel for our story, we, uh, we need to kind of begin in the middle. Uh, this is about uh, towards the end of 2013. At the beginning of 2013, researchers in Atlanta, Georgia, began um, doing some research on this thing called online purchase intent. It's a simple sales forecasting metric where you compare the prevalence of a, a cluster of keyword search terms and, and compare that to uh, the sales of a product related to that keyword or that, that cluster of keywords. And so they, they simply um, applied that same metric to a cluster of keywords associated with sexual exploitation. 11 cities were monitored over about a year and a half. Portland, Oregon was one of them where I'm from. The aggregate of the other 10 cities, if you would imagine a horizontal graph with zero being right in the middle, the aggregate of the other 10 cities hovered right around that zero mark uh, for the span of that study. Out of those 11 cities, only one took a dramatic drop in, in, in activity associated with those, those keyword search terms. Portland was that city, and it just happened to co uh, correspond roughly with the beginning of this initiative. There's, there was 11 men in Portland that started engaging, directly engaging online sex buyers at the point of sale. And so it corresponded uh, directly with that activity. So this is a story about literally how a bunch of guys in a major West Coast city contributed to a nearly 60% reduction in, in online activity associated with sexual exploitation. I thought you were talking to some back. No. Presentation back. Okay. Um, here's, here's more of that story. In late, late summer of 2013, myself and, and 10 other guys in Portland we decided that while ending the demand for prostituted people is the ultimate goal, it's the end game for all of us, given our limited resources and, and our limited, quite frankly, our, our limited experience, we should start maybe by figuring out how to disrupt that demand. And so we came up with, uh, and, and, and I know no one from Iceland, by the way, but we came up with this, what we thought at the time was an innovative idea, of posting fake ads online, taking calls from active online sex buyers and attempting to have a man-to-man -man conversation with them about what their behavior does to the victims, to the communities, and to themselves. We began just by simply calling this the Cyber Patrol, but the buyers would insist on knowing who we were and so we would say, well, we're just a bunch of guys who want this injustice to stop and so the name kind of stuck, and it's known now as literally a bunch of guys. Are we getting close? All right. So here's a snapshot of, of what's happened uh, since that time about three and a half years ago. We now have 175 men. That is the graph right there, and that is roughly when we began our intervention. So. so so here's a snapshot of, of what's happened since then. We are literally just a bunch of guys. We have 175 men in six cities over the span of three and a half years. We've run more than 300 multi-hour patrols, as we call them. We've posted more than 1,000 online ads. We've invested over 4,500 volunteer hours. And the result of that is over 40,000 direct contacts with online sex buyers. These are men talking to men. Now, 
Disrupting the global sex market, uh, the global market of exploitation, means confronting this intractable mythology that enables it. It's a mythology that, that's built on gendered violence towards women and entitlement for men. It's a mythology that leads men to believe that, that prostituting people is a victimless crime. But the most troubling outcome of all of this is what I would call a damnable dichotomy, wherein exploited women suffer under a staggering weight of trauma and stress, but the consequences for the buyers are largely nominal. But here's the thing. If there were no buyers, there would be no business. We know that men create demand, but it's equally true that better men, humble, skilled, and well-led, can disrupt this business and help reduce that demand. So after about a year of patrolling the online marketplace, uh, we noticed that we we're encountering the same guys over and over again, many of the same buyers, and our observations corresponded with preliminary research that suggests that 5% of buyers, roughly, account for almost 50% of the transactions. These buyers tend to be more preferential and often more violent. And they're obviously of greater concern for law enforcement. So we analyzed our data and we identified 75 of the most active buyers in our community. And within a year, and we, so we gave that list to the Portland Police Bureau. Within a year, 20 of those men had been arrested, including the top 10 most prolific buyers in our community. Number one on that list was a local small business owner our volunteers had engaged more than 60 times. I should say 60, not six. More than 60 times. Now, our experience has caused us to consider another important point when talking to buyers. And it's, it's the notion of choice. When first arrested, our number one buyer freely admitted to buying sex three to four times a week all year long. Clearly, this is a man with choices, right? He enjoyed the freedom to spend copious amounts of time shopping for sex. He had the ability to choose multiple partners each week, and he had the resources to support his behavior. And it's... Excuse me. It's not all that unusual a story when you're talking about sex buyers. More often than not, they're white, middle-aged, middle-income, employed, married with children. But when you look at prostituted persons and what they face every day, it's a different story. More often than not, they're women of color. They face extreme violence, struggle with various addictions, homelessness, unemployment, trauma, and mental illness. So when you look at the two parties involved, in this transaction, you have to ask the question, who really has the choice? This is hard work, and we know it. As men talking to other men in an attempt to persuade them to stop buying sex, we know that our strategy goes against the current, the cultural current that turns men into consumers and women into objects for consumption, and that current is strong. And I believe it gains its strength from the normalizing force of ubiquitous pornography. The men we encounter, oh, I, I, I hold on here. Um, this, th these, image, th these images that you're seeing, uh, this is just a little bit of a glimpse of why we're hopeful. Th these images that you're seeing uh, were part of a text messaging campaign that were sent out to buyers. And, and this is just some of the responses that we got. Um, we sent out about 30,000 of these, and a very small proportion of them actually opted out of getting subsequent messages. So again, the idea of technology um, being used against those doing the exploiting is a very, very powerful experience. So let me go on to the next one here. Um, we know that men are so immersed in this current that they don't even know there's another, uh, there's another way to think about sex and relationships. And so it gives us, it, it causes us to spe give special attention to their motivation. We use a survivor informed and edited script when we talk to buyers. I listened to a buyer engage uh, one of our trained volunteers about a year ago. And in the middle of, of the conversation, the buyer cut off our, our volunteer and literally said, whatever, dude, I just want to get laid. And then hung up. So we've thought long and hard about what it will take for buyers to change their behavior. What's their motivation for change? Is it the risk of exposure? Uh, is it a criminal record? Is it the loss of a job? 
or the loss of a family. And the one thing that we've learned that's really discouraging is that there's a lot of guys for whom there's, there is absolutely no motivation for change. But we've encountered many others that are open to it. On another occasion, our volunteers engaged a buyer who listened compliantly to the script and hung up. 30 minutes later, he called back and said, I think I have a problem and I need help. Can you help me? At which point our volunteers were able to connect that buyer with local resources specializing in sexual addiction. After a year and a half, we followed up with about 8,000 of these buyers, and that's the reference to this text messaging campaign that I talked about. And these kinds of things, these kinds of experiences give us hope, but here's the thing. We realize that there's, there's so much more work to be done. So we choose our words carefully. We choose our words carefully because we too are men. We live in that same world of objectification and exploitation. And we choose our words carefully because we've learned time and again, we've learned that when speaking to a buyer at the point of sale, grace is more powerful than shame. And while we firmly insist that buyers take accountability for their actions, we do not judge. That's not our job. Ultimately, we don't know if the men we talk to actually stop buying sex. We don't know what happens in their hearts and minds when they hang up the phone. We don't know how much more it will take to turn the tide. So what do we know? We know four things for sure. We know that men create demand. We know that business is booming. And while it's clear that technology fuels and enables demand, we also know it could be made to serve demand disruption. And we know that better men have a role to play, a vital role to play in the fight to end this injustice. Nazi resistor Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, we are not to simply bandage the wounds of the victims beneath the wheels of injustice. We are to drive a spoke into the wheel itself. In the final analysis, we believe men are uniquely suited to disrupt this market. And we honestly hope that our efforts will inspire other men to make a lasting contribution to the overall effort to eradicate the forced prostitution of the vulnerable. And we are especially proud to, to labor alongside partners like Annie Cannon's, a victim-focused NGO dedicated to providing web development training exclusively for survivors so that they can successfully compete in today's job market with skills that translate into livable wages. Thank you so much for your time. It's been my greatest honor to just share our story with you today. Um, I'll start today with a little story of our own. Uh, it actually starts with Tom. Uh, Tom's working with a survivor leader and thinking about making a website uh, that helped display some survivors' realities uh, that he could send to buyers to try to discourage them. And he met with us and we talked about it and we said, you know what, as it happens, we have a graduate who has talked independently about wanting to create a website where, yeah, sorry, where, um, where survivors can tell their reality uh, and change the kind of uh, paradigms that are circulating about them that are false. So that seems perfect. We would love to have that graduate build your website. And we talked to her and we told her about the project and it was the first time that we had ever talked about Tom's work. Uh, and she said, okay, I'll do it. And she got very quiet. I said, don't have to. She said, it's not that. She became very upset. And she explained to us that she was upset because if Tom's successful and demand goes down and her phone doesn't ring when she places her own ads in that situation, she's punished. Women like her are punished. And I tell you this story because it is relevant to the whole reason that we started doing what we're doing, which is we found, uh, as we worked in, worked around the anti-trafficking movement, that we heard very few survivor voices. Um, the very few survivors were really driving the solutions that were being created. And we're of the opinion that survivors hold a vast potential for innovation, not only in the anti-trafficking movement, but in civilization as a whole. And they're being ignored. So here we are. 
So the story we heard, and um, despite all of our uh, technical expertise, we cannot convert a PowerPoint. Um, the stories we kept hearing about human trafficking were there's this victim and she's gullible and she's tricked and then she gets chained up and her trafficker is this horrible psychopath that's really poor. Um, but the reality that we were seeing is that the victim was just vulnerable because of poverty, because of discrimination, uh, because of conflict around her and him, uh, but that she was quite resilient and that she was coerced with something much more than chains. Uh, and that her trafficker was someone who was very rich and very powerful and very organized. Um, and that, in fact, even if she was able to escape or be rescued from a situation of exploitation, she would find herself subject to those same vulnerabilities that drove her to be trafficked in the first place. And so the cycle would happen over and over again. And in fact, our students tell us frequently that they visited a shelter three to seven times before they came to us, as they were rescued three to seven times. So the solution that we've created uh, is intended to deliver them quality incomes. And, uh, and I will say that there's much need in the world for uh, helping survivors earn enough to subsist, enough to make it. Uh, but we want to go one step further. We want to go to the step that makes them powerful. Um, so the kind of income that gives them not only short-term stability, but long-term stability for themselves and their families so that they are no longer vulnerable uh, so that they no longer doubt their capacity to be important in the world, uh, and so that they do not go back to a trafficker or find themselves in a situation where they might be exploited again. Um, our hope is that that means every time someone is rescued, quote unquote, um, their trafficking ends for good. We do that in three ways. The first way is to run a training program that starts with turning on the computer and teaches students everything from digital literacy to testing, to the software lifecycle, to front-end development, and for some, uh, full-stack web development, building mobile apps even. Um, we have a freelance impact outsourcing shop. We go out and find clients. Uh, we manage the projects, and we give the work to our graduates so that they can earn quality incomes. Um, and the third piece is that we actually build products that they ideate. So these are their ideas to fight the underlying causes of their exploitation. And we try to make those products a reality, and we try to use the value of our privilege and our networks to help expand the reach of those products throughout the world. So, yes. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit more about our method. Um, so one of the most important things for us is finding those partners uh, in our community that are providing shelter, providing case management and counseling, um, providing nutrition, providing all of those sorts of holistic wraparound services, but that key job training, that reintegration piece, to get someone to be economically independent uh, is missing. And so that's, that's where we like to fill in the gap, and that's, like we would how, that's how we would like our organization to grow, is finding those organizations that know their community and are supporting them uh, with wonderful services but need this kind of job training piece. So as Jessica mentioned, this kind of outlines um, the three different uh, phases or kind of ways that we have people go through our program. Um, and the first phase is that, is that filling that privilege gap. So what someone wasn't able to experience if they didn't have a computer in their house growing up, um, as well as personal finance. We do personal finance at the beginning of our course, and then at the end, once people start making money, because it's very different when you have not a zero in your bank account. Um, and so we get people to the point where um, after those first six weeks, they can actually start taking data entry work or data management work or doing software testing um, as they continue um, learning front-end web development skills if they want. A lot of people asked us, you know, why don't, you know, when you train someone, um, do they just go out and get a job at Google or Facebook? And our response is, we want people to be able to go out and find work if they want, but it's incredibly difficult for someone to go out with, you know, childcare needs and other kinds of barriers of entry that women, especially women of color, face in the technology industry. So we source that work for them that they can do in a shelter or in a safe place um, so that by the time they finish our program, they've built an application, they've built a client website, they're building up their portfolio, they can keep working with us for as long as they want. Um, and then eventually, if they do want to go get that tech company job, we can help train them for the interview. And there's a lot less of that self-doubt. And there's, there's just so much more driving them in that interview. And then we can also expand the training out from just front-end web development to things like visual design and product management or my personal favorite, some more um, kind of back-end architecture type things that we have students working on now. 
Um, and like Justin mentioned, these, this building of a class project is so important uh, because it really anchors our training and it allows someone throughout the course to see how their ideas go from something that, you know, is just addressing a problem that they see in their own lives that they don't think a lot of other people care about, to feeling connected, to hearing people like all of you hear about their product and, and what they want to do in the world and how they've written every single line of code to have an impact. Um, and so that brings me really quickly, um, just some of the before and afters for our students in our class. Um, not knowing how to copy and paste um, on a computer um, to building websites and web apps with J JavaScript. Um, hoping for minimum wage, we have a lot of people coming in asking about what they can do to get access to a minimum wage job, to earning 20 to $30 per hour for data entry and testing, um, and up to $2,000 for full stack websites for clients. And then just living in an isolated and antagonized way, like Jessica mentioned, um, being in different safe houses and not really feeling that sense of community or rootedness, um, to being part of a team. Um, building products that fight gender-based violence and hungry to teach others. So we have successful graduates become teaching assistants in our future classes, and then if they choose, they can go on to be trained to become an instructor. And then um, this is the product that we wanted to highlight for you today. Um, this is uh, Laura, one of our first graduates. She built this web application called survivors.io. Um, this is in addition to her making a lot of money doing web development, which is very exciting. Um, this website, the, the motivation behind it was to anonymously, to collect anonymous data on sexual assault, where anyone could log into this website and drop a, map, uh, drop a pin on the map and be able to give some basic anonymous information about what happened. Uh, because our students said that if only 2% of sexual assaults are reported to the police, we're not getting good information about what's happening. We're not creating community around what happened, what happened and making people feel like they're not alone. Um, and so we're really excited to get this product out into the world, um, and we would appreciate your help with that. Yeah, so Survivors.io started off, like, like most apps, as the beta app, just that map that you see uh, where folks can make reports. And we thought it would be great to get better data. Uh, and then, as with all software, we just tested it in the world, and we found out that what people are really striving for is community. Uh, you might have noticed after the election, there was a sort of outpouring of sexual assault survivors telling their stories for the first time uh, uh, and acknowledging that they weren't alone for the first time. And so now we're looking at making this platform into something much bigger, uh, a community space uh, and also a, a platform for political action where survivors can come together, whether they're survivors of human trafficking, of gender-based violence, uh, of sexual assault, uh, and really drive change as a group uh, and escape the, uh, the victim shaming that really holds us back from ending rape culture. Um, but the young woman who built this is the same young woman that we talked to about Tom's site, actually. And she will soon help Tom build his platform, uh, and she will make a good income this year. Um, but the thing I want to tell you as an ending point is that that economic power that she's gaining, uh, she's not intending to use just for herself. The thing that she's told us she wants to do is to use her income to build a better shelter uh, that will help other human trafficking survivors reintegrate successfully. And that's exactly the kind of innovation that we were hoping to foster. So thank you very much. So demand interception is skillful and successful at ending human trafficking, but that doesn't mean it liberates trafficked survivors. As you can see, once enslaved persons are emancipated, they need all kinds of support, vocational training like what Annie Cannons does, and it turns out other kinds of support as well. And so Mariana's gonna to talk to us about legal advocacy. Thank you. Hello everyone. You've heard that smartphones are the brothels of today. And at Alight, we say that smartphones can also be tools for justice. Human trafficking is a grave injustice that is based on someone's vulnerability and someone in a position of power exploiting it. And so legal advocacy and resources are critical to be able to empower these individuals to rebuild their lives, 
escape cycles of vulnerability, and to be re-trafficked. As Annie Can Cannons was also saying, um, building into this concept of intercepting demand, we also have to keep in mind what's next. How do we make sure that the people that are liberated from trafficking, separated from their traffickers, have the resources that they need to move on and actually rebuild their lives? When we look at the numbers, they're pretty dismal. The UNODC said that in 2015, less than 19,000 <coughs> traffickers were prosecuted on record. And the US report said that many countries went, went without a single conviction. Even with these low numbers, we know that survivors of trafficking have even less access to legal assistance. For them, Justice, a lot of times, is different than how others may see justice for them. What is meaningful justice for a trafficked survivor? You know, if we think about it, a lot of times it's just about dealing with whatever are the problems in front of them. Whatever are these basic problems. And survivors come from all walks of lives, and they have all kinds of stories. And so their legal needs are as diverse as they are. For example, you may have one person that's married to their trafficker, and so they need to divorce their trafficker to really have a chance to move on in their life. Another person may have had a trafficker ruin their credit, or steal their identity, or hold their documents, and that continues to harm them, and they need help fighting the creditors, getting new identity documents, applying for things in their own name. For someone else, and this is a common problem that Sheva has pointed to, traffickers may be forcing people into crimes like prostitution and theft that then go on the criminal records of these survivors and continue to harm them and continue to haunt them and impede their ability to move on. If you have a criminal record, <laughs> if you have a long uh, you know, rap sheet, uh, that affects your ability to apply for benefits, your economic, your economic opportunities, housing, it just continues on. So a light comes in with an interest of how can we harness and use resources that are not traditionally used in the anti-trafficking community. And specifically that's lawyers. Lawyers in law firms and lawyers in the private sector. How can we rein in these resources for good? Um, we are, you can see on the screen, the Four Bells app, we are utilizing and developing new technology that matches need to expertise in real time. And so um, this is using a smartphone that connects a survivor through their service provider to a pool of lawyers, really an army of lawyers. And they could be connected to the relevant lawyer from that army based on their need. So for one person, if they need a divorce attorney and they walk through the door of an allied community partner who's their service provider, through the app they're connected to a family attorney. Someone else that needs their credit fought for and you know that collections agencies fought for, they're connected to bankruptcy attorneys or commercial attorneys. For someone else that has a criminal background that needs to be cleared, they're connected to criminal lawyers. And so this is immediate and real-time matching for the app and using tech for good after it's been used for the efficiency of the traffickers for so long. And so as we build a powerful community response and are growing this innovative and collaborative way of connecting, we want to ask you if you want to be part of the solution. So if you are, or someone you know, is in an NGO that works with survivors with trafficking needs, or are an attorney with a range of background that you may not think of, like civil law, criminal law, tax law, general commercial contract law, all these different areas of law, we can use that. We can plug that in. So please get in touch. We would love to hear from you. You can email us, and there will be more information. But we're at connect at alightnet.org, and we have more more chances to connect. So thank you.
Thank you, Marilana. Thank you for the amazing work you're doing. And those of you signing up on the sign-up sheet um, will hear from all of these partners. So if you're interested in further connection with them, we can give that to you. Um, just to let you know, this panel is on track to be uh, complete at 6.15. I know some of you have places you need to go. You can see from the variety of entanglements and needs that a traffic survivor is left with after being crushed by this experience into the diamond and pearl that we get to see in Miss Regina, that it makes far more sense to prevent this from happening in the first place than to try to resolve it after it's already occurred. In the Yellow Emperor's Classic of Chinese Medicine, it says, to treat an illness after one is already sick is like trying to dig a well after you're already thirsty. So our next speakers know from firsthand experience in the field, better than all of us, how important it is to prevent this from happening, and as a result, created a program that does exactly that. It is my pleasure to uh, introduce Alex and Talia from the Children's Rescue Alliance and the Children's Defense Alliance. Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for being with us. We appreciate it. My name is Dr. Talia Witkowski. I'm a psychologist and I also specialize in critical incident response. And I'm also the marketing director for Children's Defense Alliance. Everyone in this room knows that the reality of human trafficking is such a heinous topic that many choose to ignore it completely or disillusion themselves that it's a topic that only affects certain demographics or regions of the world. But this is not true. It affects all regions and all people worldwide. And avoiding the subject or pretending that it doesn't exist only empowers the perpetrators. The fact is this. The human psyche can tolerate as much truth as it believes it has the power to do something about. I'll repeat this. The human psyche can only tolerate as much truth about a topic as it believes that it has the power to do something about. So to that end, we offer education as a tool of empowerment so that all people can educate themselves and their communities and get involved to help end human trafficking worldwide. Uh, we are... Children's Rescue Alliance, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and our mission is threefold. We facilitate the rescue of American children who are kidnapped and trafficked, but no child is ever left behind. We educate communities about the truths of human trafficking and teach prevention classes, and we promote public policy and advocacy. I'm Alex Riggs, and I'm the CEO and founder. And like, what we've heard today is just so heartbreaking, but every abduction that we can prevent is one less rescue that we have to facilitate. And as many of you are aware of, rescues are very, very, very difficult when someone's abducted. And to add to that, if we can prevent an abduction, that's one less family that's ripped apart at the seams. The best prevention is education, and we found that out the hard way. The Children's Defense Alliance was created just for this to really educate those that are the most vulnerable in our community, and that's our children. So what we do, Children's Defense Alliance is the educational arm of Children's Rescue Alliance, and we provide educational classes for children as young as four years old, teens, parents, educators, counselors, clergy, and communities, really, and we talk about the heinous crimes that are being committed against our children as a whole. And we also teach them how to protect themselves and how to pre prevent from becoming a statistic, basically. Um, our organization really began six years ago, and we focused really on American children. Because what we realized, Americans have this false sense of being safe, that it doesn't happen here on our soil, that it happens over there. And there's really nothing farther from the truth. But over the years, we've now gone worldwide. We provide our programs worldwide, and now we're facilitating rescues worldwide. And people ask us, how did we get into education? Because that's not our background, we're not educators. But our background in military operations, and we also had a lot of people that specialized in intelligence. Our partners are Special Marine Con forces. Um, our programs are really vastly different 
from most of the programs out there. And it's really based on our field experience and what we've seen in the field and actually how traffickers operate. And so our programs are really based on what works and how to prevent traffickers from actually being able to commit these crimes. We all know that human trafficking can be a difficult subject to talk about, especially with those who have no previous exposure to it. Some would rather hear nails on a chalkboard than actually have this conversation. Um, and that is why we do what we do. Um, our programs are inter interactive educational programs. They're incredibly important. And it's vital not only getting the information out, but empowering those that feel helpless to do anything about it. So rather than wanting to kind of stick your head in the sand, if you have tools like education that you could share in your community and as such, it makes it a tolerable conversation. CDA has a number of educational classes for children. We start at ages four, we go all the way up to adulthood. We work with children, families, communities, and we also have certification programs so that teachers and clergy and community leaders can be educated and share with their communities. We've taught over 350 programs over the last 27 months in schools, churches, libraries, and civic organizations. Last year, CDA developed a comprehensive national pilot program for the high school students um, in the U.S. called the Teen Safety Awareness Program. It was approved by the U.S. Institute of Museums and Library Services. It includes our prevention and evasion training along with safety and awareness in dating, bullying, cyberbullying, cyberstalking, stalking, social media, drug and alcohol misuse, and suicide. We are pleased to be working alongside the United States public library and school systems in preventing abduction and raising awareness of children nationwide on our programs and are now being used worldwide as well in multiple languages. Like I just mentioned, our background really enables us to look at trafficking from a different perspective. It's really unique in the fact that we look at it from the perspective of the traffickers and how they target what we call or victimize their victims. And because of that, our programs have become very effective. We literally only teach what is effective when someone's a target and how to get away. We also talk about how traffickers operate. How do they target? How do they stalk? They're great strategists. They blend in. They know how to stalk their victims, and sometimes they'll stalk their victims for weeks and months before they strike, just waiting for an opportune moment. And we all know that human trafficking, you know, is a great issue. We all know 30, every 30 seconds a child's trafficked somewhere in the world, but every 10 minutes a child is trafficked in the United States. And 83% of those trafficked within the United States are American children. And that's something that we need to pay attention to. Worldwide, human trafficking is a grave situation. And people ask us all the time, but what about America? You talk about America all the time. Why is it such a big problem? Well, since we're in New York, I like to use the analogy, what about Yankee Stadium? Tra Imagine filling Yankee Stadium up with nothing but children under the age of 18. Now fill it up six more times. That's how many children at any given moment are being trafficked within the United States. It and it's really difficult. We're translating our programs because this not only affects America, but it affects everyone. So we're translating our programs monthly, three and four different languages a month, so that we can provide them universal because what we use in the color code we'll share with you shortly, it's really universal. And this is another great situation on international borders. So human trafficking is a worldwide issue and affects at equal rates children all over the world. According to the U.S. State Department, 600 to 800,000 people are trafficked across international borders every year, of which 80% are female and half are children. That population equates to Stockholm, Sweden, Mombasa, Kenya, Acapulco, Mexico, and Amsterdam, Netherlands. Netherlands. Um, just to give you perspective, currently there are approximately 20 to 30 million slaves in the world, modern-day slavery. That population would be the same as the population of Nepal, Ghana, Afghanistan, Taiwan, or Australia. This is a worldwide problem. People are being bought and sold and smuggled, and this is what is referred to, as we all know, as modern-day slavery. And trafficking doesn't discriminate. Those who fall prey to the predators can be of any race, religion, background. Traffickers really don't discriminate. But what we found as well as facilitating rescues, 
that the best way to protect a child is to educate a child. And so we teach them to raise their awareness on their situation and so that they can be their first line of defense. So we went back to our roots, basically, and we designed programs that are loosely based on the Marine Military Code of Awareness, which is about 500 pages. But we simplified it so that even a four-year-old can understand it. And all of our programs revolve around this color code. Um, because every, at every single instant, in every single instance, you can look at a reactionary color and know what space you're in. So when we teach the kids, we teach them that, oh, it went away. <laughs> we teach them that red is a dangerous situation, orange means you have to be aware, um, yellow is caution, green means there's no danger. This is, they've really uh, received this really well, and it's, it's an awesome um, education for them. All of our programs focus on awareness, prevention, evasion, and self-protection. They're age-specific, they're interactive, and they're customized to the community, country, religious affiliation, et cetera, of the audience that we are presenting to. And I know we have to wrap this up. We kind of ran out of time. But anyone that's interested in our programs, please talk to us. Um, we're working worldwide with partners. Um, we've provided programs now to Nigeria, Somalia, Mexico City, Afghanistan, um, even Iran. So if you have any interest, please talk to us. There's so much more information that we don't have time to share with you today. But one of the best things that I can share with you coming from a security perspective, and people ask us all the time, is what can I do? We're all taught to have you know, routines and to have our children on routines. And the one thing that I can say is vary those routines up because traffickers do stalk what they call their prey. We, we all have the same routines. We go to work, school, the same routes. You know, we, we jog the same time every morning. You know, we walk the dog at the same time. And so what I say to you is vary those routines up because traffickers are relying on you to have the same methodical approach every day to what you do. And they look for those instances where they can grab your children. And that's what we do. We don't want to have to facilitate rescues anymore. Our phone never stops ringing. We got into this by accident six years ago. And we're not educators. But stay vigilant. If you see something, say something. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. We'll share um, just two stories of success stories of what happened with our program. So one child, um, it's not just a program that helps to end abduction for sex trafficking, but obviously molestation. Um, is a huge travesty to children worldwide. And so we had a child that came to our program and he was being molested by a, um, a friend of the family and his mother didn't know about this. And in our program, we teach things like uh, appropriate language to use when you're being uh, taken advantage of or hurt or in a compromising situation. Uh, we teach kids to put their hands out in front of them, which is the universal sign for stop or that I need help. We, we teach them to say stop, call 911, not my mommy, not my daddy. So this child who was always being taken advantage of by a family friend started screaming from the bathroom, stop, because he, he was taught to trust his instincts. And so his instinct had always said, this isn't right. But after having our class, he realized that he could actually use his words and he had the words to use. He started screaming from the bathroom and his mother came to his aid, which is wonderful. Um, another girl who was a teenager who was taking our class and she was just sitting in the back playing on her phone the whole time. So we didn't think she was taking much of anything in. Um, and her mother and her contacted us a couple of weeks after they came to the program and said that she was actually in the process of being uh, groomed by her boyfriend at the time uh, to be abducted into the sex trade. And because of the things that we taught her in class, she became hyper aware of her situation and reached out to her mother and they reached out to us and we were able to help in that situation too. So a little bit of education goes a really long way. We have tons of programs for any community and if we could ever be of service, please let us know. Thank you so much. So in addition to this incredibly exciting work that is happening to educate children and their parents and educators about how this can be prevented, I am thrilled to say that post-secondary education is also carrying the torch in academic institutions. And um, one of the leaders and pioneers in that field is with us as our final speaker today. I am thrilled to introduce Stephen Rosman from Tougaloo University. 
Good evening. It's actually Tougaloo College. It's in Jackson, Mississippi. And I am the uh, co-director of the newly created Institute for the Study of Modern Day Slavery. And academia has a very important place to roll, to, a role to play in this whole system. The key to fighting modern day slavery is networking. Nonprofit organizations, law enforcement, government agencies, and educational institutions. Tougaloo College, if anybody knows its history, was built on a former slave plantation, the Bodie Plantation in uh, just the outskirts of Jackson, Mississippi. Yeah, and we still have the mansion, the home of the slave owner, uh, which is refurbished on our campus. The outside's been refurbished. The inside is about to be refurbished. And guess where we are going to have the Institute for the Study of Modern Day Slavery located? Talk about irony. Now, the motto of Tougaloo College is where history meets the future. We've got plenty of history, studying slavery, abolition. Tougaloo was a focal point. It was the main center for the struggle, the civil rights struggle, and the abolition of Jim Crow. And we thought it would be great to have it as a center for the abolition of slavery as it exists today. Slavery has always existed. It just has changed its uh, image. It's, it's changed its, uh, not its nature but it's changed its style. It's, it's, it, it, what's so, so insidious about slavery today is that it is illegal and more difficult to detect because the slave owners cannot go out and flaunt what they're doing. We were funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. We've, uh, last June, we began a three-year grant from the Mellon Foundation to develop our, center for the, uh, our Institute for the Study of Modern Day Slavery. And they said, we want you to be the vanguard among historically black colleges and universities because these institutions should have a particular commitment to struggle against slavery. And so right away we brought Morehouse College into our partnership with us, one of the institutions under the grant, one of the most famous historically black colleges. And we brought Bennett College of Greensboro, North Carolina in. And we're going to expand beyond that. We're partnered with Historians Against Slavery, the leading academic institution in the United States, the leading academic network in the United States dedicated to the abolition of modern day slavery. We recently had a conference uh, just this past week, and our keynote speaker was Kevin Bales, the director of the founder of the Free to Slaves, the, that index that many people refer to that talks about 46 million people being enslaved in the world today. And Kevin and Zoe Trod from the University of Nottingham were speakers, and they are going to be networking with us. I was in Brazil two Novembers ago, participating in a conference of the organization there. So basically, we're positioned to network, build on this grant, creating a center, network locally, nationally, and internationally, because we need an international network, because slavery, as we know, is a flow from country to country. It's a process. Slaves are marketed. And so the more we can establish a network uh, uh, globally and have people work together, develop uh, chat rooms for ex exchanges, we're in the process of developing our website. It's not fully online yet. I have brochures that I guess are being so, <laughs> they're being distributed now, excellent. I figured, oh, I didn't make enough of them because we have such a tremendous turnout. But basically, one of our partners is Free International, and they participated in our conference. And what they do, they're involved in a rescue operation with the, uh, with the local authorities. And the individual who was at our conference says, I go to the Super Bowl, I go to these other areas, and I've got pictures of uh, missing uh, girls, and I look for them and see if they're being marketed. And this is a difficult task because very often the kid comes up empty. Sometimes he'll find somebody, he'll alert authorities. And I don't envy him because Super Bowl is going to be played in my hometown of, I'm in Mississippi now, my hometown of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And 
uh, Super Bowl that he to be outside in early February, so that is dedication. But he said, look, Tougaloo College can be great for us because what we want to do is network with your mass communications department because you can help us in the work that we're doing. So basically, uh, what we're talking about is network, and we want to net all of you who are interested in, in networking with an, a, 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 really a, a, a group of academic uh, institutions centered at Tougaloo College, uh, let me know because we want to network with you. These brochures have my contact information. And if you did not get one, and uh, I will just come up afterwards, and I'll make sure I give you a card so we can work with people who are interested in working with us. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, all of you, for braving the weather and sticking it out with us. You know, um, in conclusion, just a few things. Looking at human trafficking only as a human rights violation or a crime limits our ability to solve it. But when we look at it the way the traffickers do, as a business, it opens up a whole new domain of leverage for us to intercept and disrupt the demand that drives the business and change the tide for all three forces caught in its web. And we can use the same things the traffickers do to untangle that web, anonymity and technology. When we do, and especially when we do in partnership with law enforcement, civil society, building a civilian army that's bigger than the problem, that collaborates with, as Stephen said, networks with government agencies and law enforcement, it works. And we know from Tom's work that the buyers want to be educated and related to around this issue. One thing he went by very, very quickly is that when these buyers receive his graphic text campaign, the click-through weight to his website is huge. They want to be engaged in conversation. They want to heal, a large majority of them. But these buyer interception, civilian cyber policing initiatives also target the buyers who don't want to heal, who are repeat offenders, who are the most violent. And that makes law enforcement efforts more efficient. They know who to go after. So that partnership is successful in disrupting demand. And when demand is disrupted, then we are left with the need to consider the aftermath for the survivors, legal advocacy, vocational training, and educating young people, their parents and young adults, about human trafficking and what they can do to prevent it will make the need for all of this irrelevant someday. That is our commitment as a panel. And we are living proof of what Stephen said. We are a network. And we invite you to join this network because no one of us can do this alone. But together, all of us, will make this a thing of the past, and future generations will wonder how we ever tolerated this scourge. Each of us is part of the solution. As we say at Pathways to Peace, each one of us is a pathway to peace. And together, we are creating a world that works better for all, and I thank you so much for being a part of that, and I pass it to ceremony to complete.
it's past time for you to lay your life upon the ark of justice, for your notes of mercy to flow forth from your throat on my behalf. I am somebody's baby. I'm somebody's child. And I want you to look me in my eyes and speak to me that I'm not worthy to have the warmth of your being wrap itself across my lonely soul. Tell me that I'm not lovely enough for you to risk your life for me. I'm somebody's baby. I'm somebody's child, and it's cold out here, standing in fear, trembling in unbelief, having to, to feel and to smell filth. Don't I have a right to live, to life? I'm somebody's baby. I'm somebody's child. Do you not think about what my days look like, what the hours and the seconds and the minutes bring? then I don't truly know what a blue sky looks like because the lenses of my eyes have been painted over with the sweat of a multitude who breathed death into my spirit that I can't remember how the beautiful touch of love should resonate through my being or how it should kiss my brow because my soul has been cracked into tiny shards of brittle brokenness and every day, every day, I am torn by an endless stream of hate and it takes me over. So listen, listen. Won't you hear my cry today? And won't you hug the rivers that leak from my eyes and, and taste my tears? Will you? Will you? I'm somebody's baby. I'm somebody's child, and I'm yours to love, yours. I'm somebody's baby, I'm somebody's child. 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 I'm somebody's